road racing and the interest people have shown and there have been some great marathons and some road, great road races that have been organized in the area by different MFs in different countries. So needless to say that we decided to put together a seminar and uh, we are very indebted and great to Mr. Nori Williamson, who is the resource person and the lecturer for this uh, three day seminar. Mr. Nori has extensive knowledge and Nori has been working at all levels with the road, road racing community and the road racing organizers and rest assured that his knowledge will help us, will guide us, and would be a guideline for future road racing events, particularly in our area and also all over the world. Um, I see some very familiar faces. I see uh, we have a gathering of ITOs, TOs, uh, in road measurers, surveyors. So like me, I'm a student at this seminar and I'd like to request everybody to pay attention. I'm taking notes and please take advantage of this. And you can also take notes and hopefully we'll come out after three days of attending this seminar as more knowledgeable people and professionals towards the event of road racing. Thank you very much. Without taking further time, uh, we are going to take over and let's start off this seminar. Thank you very much, Mr. Salman. And now, we, before we start with the webinar, we would like to introduce you some IG, uh, ADC Jakarta staff. Sorry, I forgot to do that the first, first time. So we, will, uh, we, we, we have here Mr. Ria Lumintuarso as ADC Jakarta Director, and then Mr. Dwi Priyono, uh, Deputy ADC Jakarta Director. And then we have Mr. Adi Karyadi, the IT staff of ADC Jakarta. Okay, so before we start the webinar, we would like to remind you that please stay on your video mode to give respect to the lecturer. And then uh, we have time to, to make a question. Uh, there is a question and answer uh, time session. So you, you will be available for that. So before, uh, sorry, without, without uh, lengthen the time. So we are cordially invite Mr. Nori Williamson to start the class. Mr. Nori Williamson's time is yours. Thanks very much and uh, hello and welcome from South Africa. It's morning here and it's uh, winter, so a bit on the chilly side. I'm indeed very privileged to and honored to be given this opportunity of uh, sharing and hopefully putting forward some ideas on road running. Um, as you can see, uh, I'm not the youngest uh, in this uh, seminar, uh, but it does bring opportunities and so on with uh, having been around the world with road running. Um, I'm going to give you, try and share my screen here first of all, see if we can get that up there and start slideshow, current slide, there we go there. Um, so yes, indeed a very great privilege to to be spending time with uh, you all. I've seen a bit of the, the listing of people that are on board. I'm glad to see there's some course measurers and uh, ITOs out there, and also some event organizers. I think the diversity that we've got in this symposium um, is excellent, and it will help us all uh, see things from different viewpoints. I'd like to share just a couple of minutes on my um, background so that you, you know where I'm coming from and what sort of level of experience I have. So I'm a professional structural and civil engineer by training. 
uh, but I very quickly got bored with um, designing columns and floors and bridges and so on, um, and have basically turned into uh, an athletics junkie uh, or nerd since about 1992. I was actually born in Scotland. I was a rugby player, front row. You would never believe it with my stature. I left Scotland in 1981 and immediately started running um, because of a race we have in South Africa called Comrades Marathon, which is a double marathon. And that just seemed to me to be a challenge. Uh, so I ended up running distances, mainly the 50 kilometer through to within two years of our starting a thousand kilometer and 24 hours. Uh, as you will all know, SA was isolated until 1993. In the late 80s and 90s, I was part of that change. Uh, in 83, triathlon came to South Africa, and I did Hawaii Ironman in 1984, and also a major international event as a team in 1984, London to Paris triathlon, and so started the federation. So I've got an administrative background since about 1984 <laughs> in the sport. I uh, started event organizing in 1984, technical official and coaching in 1986. I wrote a book in 1989, Everyone's Guide to Distance Running. Uh, in 1995, South Africa was welcomed back into um, the international uh, arena. You will remember that we came back through our team in 1992 to the uh, Olympics. Uh, same year, I did the Spartathlon from London, uh, from Athens to Sparta. And on that basis, I got selected for Britain and uh, Scotland and various events later on. 1996, I went back for a uh, period to UK uh, as a development officer, athletics development officer for Scotland. Uh, my course measurement goes back to 1986, uh, recognised as IAAF uh, at the time, A grade, 1994, and asked to do the USA Road Symposium in Santa Barbara, where incidentally, uh, the first championships were uh, demonstrated and trialed out for use. So that's how far back transponder timing goes. As I say, represented uh, Scotland, Britain, South Africa in ultra distance and triathlon. And I've been involved with radio, TV and written press since 1986. I still write a column for one of the uh, newspapers in South Africa, and I've covered the World Champs since uh, and Commonwealth Games since about 2002. I'm now a World Technical Delegate to label events. I've had the pleasure of going to many of the Asian countries' uh, events, and uh, I'm a technical consultant to a number of events, uh, India in particular, Middle East, Africa, and of course, South Africa. So that's the sort of background. As I say, I gave up my structural engineering probably in 1992 when I opened the uh, Department of Sport and Culture at a uh, Black and Indian uh, University, as it was then um, in South Africa. So I see this as being an interactive three hours. I don't want you to be sitting listening to me all the time. I'd like some response from you as we go along, some input. And in my mind, every event is unique. It's, there's no such thing as how to organize a, red, uh, a road race. It's more a case of looking at each event and deciding have we covered and considered 
all the different options because every event has a different starting venue, every event has different culture. So please, this is about your experiences, your qu quizzes, your questions, your challenges, particularly, particularly in uh, this time when we're all having to think out of the box and we're all having to collaborate to think how we can make things better, how we can do things better. Um, so certainly there are no wrong answers and there are no correct answers or so only correct answers. Uh, we need to actually look at each event individually and come up with what is the best way of doing this now. The best way now may not be the best way next year. And I think we all found that out with COVID over the last 18 months. Anyway, uh, hopefully we'll get through about two modules this uh, today. Uh, the first one, uh, I think Rio Stuti has done a great job in the introduction and overview. Mr. Salman, thanks very much for your uh, introduction. We'll look at what is a road race. Let's go back to the very basics. If we don't understand the basics, then um, obviously uh, we, we can't move forward. So what is a road race? What is the purpose and objective of hosting a, a race? And to me, that is one of the key issues because there are many, many reasons for hosting a race. And based on that is how you will structure it. Who hosts the race? Is it the job of the Federation to host races? Or is it the job of other people? Uh, what are the cultural, international, and, uh, and resource, resource availability and differences? Because that makes a huge difference. Um, you know, it would be almost impossible to uh, host a Boston Marathon in India, for instance, you know. <laughs> Uh, so we need to look at the cultural differences. Types and structures of the hosting bodies and what sort of organizations are we looking at and how are we structuring them? And uh, then what are all the different authorities we require? And that changes country to country as you're very aware. So again, I want to emphasize, please use the chat box or Let's uh, see what questions you have. And uh, maybe Ria Stutter can um, monitor the chat box for me, just interrupt when there are questions or comments to be made. Is everyone happy with this? And can everyone see the screen? Yes. Sir. And is everyone happy with the pace of my voice? Because as Scots, we tend to speak very fast. Okay, what is a road race is where I'd like us to start. And uh, it's actually very simple. You know, I challenge you to see who's the fastest over or from this point to that point. Um, but we get greater context by having a, a time and a distance. So we know exactly where we're going to start and we know exactly where we're going to finish. Uh, that gives us some sort of uh, context. Um, if we're going to have more than one person, then we need to be able to place people in order. So there are very basic... Oh, Sorry, I don't know why that has happened. Let's come back. Yeah, there are very uh, basic and simple rules that we apply. First of all, there has to be one starting gun and we have to have agreement where the finish line is. So we bring in officials. Um, that takes away private fights. 
to have contact with other road races, we need to know or use distances that are used by other people, you know, or the recognized distances. So we need to know the distance between the start line and the finish line. We need to know the time taken by each person um, and put them in order. And if we want to have some comparison between what I'm doing here in Stellenbosch and what you're doing in, uh, in Jakarta or in Mumbai or uh, Bhutan, then ideally we want to have the same standard distances, five kilometer, 10 kilometer, 21, 42, 50, and 100 um, are now the standard distances on which you can have world records. Other distances such as 8K, 15K, 25, etc., or time-based, how far can you run in an hour, six hours, 12 hours, 24 hours, these are all world best performances at present. And then, of course, there is the relay race. Why can't we have relay races? Um, and in Asia, Ikeden is a very um, big race distance to have. So really, the, the core of what is a road race is very simple, but we make it more contextual by bringing in standards and bringing in officials um, along the way. We separate out genders, uh, greater context also with um, age groups. And of course, the world masters run from 35 right the way up. And it can be in either 10 year age groups or five year age groups. These are the standards used by world masters uh, athletics. Um, we can create different things out of a road race. Is it a road race of just friends? Is it intercompany? Is it interclub, district, national teams? Um, is it a combination of, of all of those? You know, a road race is basically the road races that we have tend nowadays to be six, seven, eight different events all run uh, at the same time, such that there are numerous results coming out of those. So for instance, uh, this year, this past year, we had the uh, South African 21 kilometer championships, but it was also an open race, open to anyone. It was closed for the championship to our uh, 17 different uh, districts or provinces, as we have them. It uh, had age groups within it. It was also the world, uh, or sorry, South African Masters um, Association age group championships. So there were about 35 to 40 different race reports that came out of that one event. It was also a world label um, event. Uh, it should have been bronze, but as you will know this year, uh, they have elite label and label standard. So there was also that open elite section on the go. Um, and so we had to ma manipulate the results to give us 35 to 40 different reports for that event. So a road race can be more or less what you want it to be. It can attract whoever you want. And that is a key thing to decide is who is the market that you're actually going for. People have different reasons for running a road race. For me, it might be a performance or a challenge over a stated distance against one of you or against myself or against my clock, um, or even against the conditions. Uh, for instance, there's a, a race in uh, uh, the Antarctic 
and a race in the Arctic. Um, you, you know, is that purely a race to see uh, if you can handle the conditions, if you can go the distance? So yeah, that, that's one of the reasons you might try to, for social interaction. That's another uh, reason people run races uh, as a good a goal. You know, can you do the distance uh, or can you beat a certain time? We hold road races as fundraisers. London Marathon uh, raises millions through people running uh, in the race, officially and unofficially. So some of them will do it for a private or a private concern. Others will do it through the London Marathon uh, charity organization. Uh, it's a marketing promotional activity. Last weekend, I was in uh, Africa, in Tanzania, and a bank put on a race. Um, they got 5,000 people over four distances. Um, and really for them, it was more about the marketing and promotional opportunity that they had. I can tell you the after party was fantastic. Um, but there were certainly some challenges in the technical aspect of the race. Uh, is it an opportunity to run with a celebrity? Is it a means of bringing tourism? I know Bhutan was looking at uh, having an event. And in that uh, event, the idea is to bring international tourists and make greater awareness of Bhutan. I was actually due to go there um, until COVID opened uh, or started in March last year. So it's something I hope is still on the calendar for the coming years. It's a means of motivation or, or wellness. I think we're all aware of Park Run, which is basically a road race being used for um, anyone to be able to go along on a Saturday and run eight o'clock on a Saturday worldwide, you will have people running a five kilometer park run. Um, that's probably the very basic level of road racing. And there are many others, uh, you know, runners have their priority, organizers have theirs, and that is what has to be decided is what sort of event are you putting on? However, in all of these, the core comes back to what is a road race. The core is the technical road race. People with a known distance, good timing, officials to adjudicate the race and um, create a set of results and make sure that people are running to a correct standard. The road race, the athletics technical aspect is owned by World Athletics, National Athletics, Area Athletics, and even District Athletics. They own it. In the world right now, what we're finding is a lot of people are coming in and borrowing into our sport, into our area, which is athletics. And we need to address this going forward. What is that partnership? What is that association? And how does everyone get um, something out of it that they want or require? And that's not always money. It's, uh, it needs to be looked at in detail. But until we get this section here correct, for me, there is no, there is no um, athletics in it. There is no road race until you get the technical section correct. And for me, that is the first part that needs to be put in place and virtually everything else gets built around it. I'm sure that may not be the case or the agreement with other people. Okay, so why host a road race? The reason uh, and objective 
of holding that road race is actually key to how you would organize it. And I come back to it again and say each event is unique. But by clarifying the purpose, it guides everything else. What sort of purposes are there? Well, national, regional, continental, world records, it's all about performance. Is that what we're looking for? If so, we're going to be looking purely internal at world athletics or uh, our athletics family. And we're probably going to be looking for the fastest possible time, fastest possible conditions, et cetera, or a head to head type competition. Is it to promote tourism? If so, then we're looking for numbers. We're looking for uh, scenery. We're looking for coverage. Is it for health? Well, we're looking for participation. We're looking for medical data, perhaps. We want to target some sort of scheme of improvement. We want to be able to measure that improvement. If you can't measure it, then you can't improve it. Is it for commercial reasons? Is it purely an event company saying, look, they want to make some money? And, and there are people out there doing that, you know, in which case we're looking at cost efficiency. Are we looking for the runner experience? Yes, of course we are, because we want them to come back next year. Um, is it for charity? Well, if it's for charity, is it for awareness? You know, is it going to be a third party financing it or is it uh, the runner's commitment to running so many kilometers and getting so much money per kilometer from their friends? Is it a structured charity? Uh, is it a multiple of all of these? And each event will have different sets of priority. If you're going for a label events, then performance is obviously a part of it. But it could be a label event in Mumbai, like ProCam do, uh, which also offers tourism, which also offers health, which is a, certainly a commercial enterprise for them as event organizers. So once you've decided what it is you're putting on, it then becomes much clearer as to what your outcomes are and how you're going to structure it. So who are the potential organizers or partners? Commercial event companies. Uh, I used an example of ProCam in India. The city, the local, regional, national authorities, governments. I mean, you know, a place like London has a professional, well, it's actually a trust organization, um, but they're bringing in all these people to London. This year, they're looking at 50,000 real runners and 50,000 uh, virtual runners, all of whom it's hoped will take the advantage of tourism to UK. Uh, the tourist bod bodies themselves are potential organizers or partners. Health authorities, health companies, medical aid companies, charities, community leadership um, organizations. These are all uh, potential partners. And then, of course, the sponsorships. And then there's a wide range of how you sponsor from very small to large. And then importantly, and this is what I say, um, we need to have a very clear understanding with all the other partners, these ones, that actually a marathon or road race is athletics property. Just as if you go to a golf club and you want to play a round of golf, you pay a day fee. You become a member of that club for a day. And the athletics family owns road running. And so any of these other people should be paying or contributing to athletics in some fashion 
if they want to use our product, because it is, it's our product. And I think that's something that a lot of events struggle with. I go to many events, I'm asked to measure the course, and I find that the event is actually being organized by a great bunch of people, but there is a resistance to interact with the local federation or the national federation because they see the federation as purely putting their hands out and not giving anything back. And that tells me that there is a lack of understanding of what a road race is. And that is something that we as federation people as need to be aware of and interact and try and show them that the benefits of being involved with the federations are far greater than them being on their own. And so often my very first task is to try and bridge that gap between the federations and the event organizers. In my particular country, South Africa, you cannot run a race unless you're a member of a club or the federation. I don't know, are there any other countries in this group that have a similar scenario where an event organizer cannot put on an event unless it's sanctioned? Rio Stuti, do you know of any? Uh, maybe, maybe some federation uh, uh, have a different different uh, objection like like in South Africa, but I'm not quite sure which one. Okay. Um, if anyone's got, can you stick your hand up? I know that in most countries in the world, um, what happens is an event organizer can put on an event and if he decides to have it ratified or but wants to become an AIMS member or a world label event, or put on one of the championships, then they have to approach the Federation. Um, and I think that's something that we were very lucky in South Africa to have. It came out of isolation during the apartheid era because the only people we could um, race against were ourselves and the, the club structure in South Africa is incredibly strong, incredibly, incredibly strong. So you buy your license, a membership fee, if you want to your club and you're given a race number that you can use for every race in the year. So it's a very structured setup in South Africa. And if you're, if you decide you wake up in the morning, you decide you're going to go along and run, then you buy a temporary license, which is valid only for that particular race. And it's destroyed at the finish or marked at the finish. So the majority, I guess, in, in this symposium will have the scenario where there needs to be an initial approach to an event or the event approaches the federation and asks for, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> asks for assistance. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's fine. That's the way it's structured. But we do need to do a better marketing to events to show them what we can give them. And what we are actually able to give them is the standardized, comparable road race results and uh, recognition. And we need to be able to put that across to event organizers. Um, the Federation is also there, of course, when there is a problem, um, when people are disputing uh, the results and of course our protest system and so on we have our jury of appeal our own, and our officials who help to give that credibility to the race so that's what we are offering poten potential event organizers 
The different uh, objectives, purposes, and financial viability will assist in determining who organizes the race. In my view, the Athletics Federation should always be one of the partners at the level of race organization. The organization of a technical race is primarily the same, irrespective of the date, the, perhaps the weather is a consideration. And so our organization should actually start as soon as we possibly can, and even more so with COVID. A lot of people are playing a wait and see game at the present moment. And um, I think that's a mistake. We all have COVID regulations. They differ from country to country. My view is we should be organizing our event now. We know it's going to be a marathon or a half marathon or a 10K. We know roughly how many people regulations are, uh, are accepting right now. We have the basics of sanitizing masks, social dis dis distancing, uh, the use of groups and wave starts or rolling starts, etc. We have all of those tools within our toolbox. We know that we're going to have to screen people as they come in. So start reviewing our race seeing how we can best organize it with these sort of basic principles. And then we, we slide it into the date that it becomes financially or practically viable. If we wait until everyone else has done it and so on and so forth, then we've got a lead time of what? Minimum three months. But a good event is normally organized over eight months or even on a yearly basis, depending on the size of event you're, you're looking at. So once we know the objective and the purpose uh, and what we're trying to achieve, we should be starting at some level to organize that event. And then we can look at how the date impacts on it. Some events, we have a Mandela Marathon, um, is the anniversary of people or places or events. You know, the, the, the Washington, uh, the Washington Marine Corps Marathon is always held on a particular day. I think it's, as I remember, it's the end of October, last week in October. Um, there are events that are held on Women's Day in South Africa, the 9th of August, and they're marketing on that particular event, or as I say, the Mandela Marathon markets on uh, the fact that he was captured in August 1962. So you can have your anniversary of events, you can have special events, there's the Christmas events that are held um, in Angola, in Portugal, uh, those are related to the date. But generally, the date is something that you're able to play with. I'm just wondering whether we should have a short break for anyone to ask questions. Are there questions any now, or is this, <clears throat> are there comments? Are there input? We are Stuti, can you see anything or is there anyone that would like to make a contribution and can you excuse me while I have a sip of coffee? Yeah, uh, there is nothing on the chat box okay. and uh, there is no waving hand. So no question for this time. Is there anyone who would like to contribute anything at this time? and? Can we get some feedback on the speed and the content so far? Yes, please Anyone? participants. You, you can, you can uh, directly ask the question to Nori. 
please. Good, um, if I may speak, Ma'am Ria. Yes, please, with, Ma'am Janet. Go ahead. With regards to the slides and the speed of the uh, speaker, it is quite good. Thank you. Thank you, Marjorie. Okay, so the other great thing that we have around the world is a diversity. Uh, I just flick on a couple of these here. This obviously is, oh, let's see if we can go back. This is London uh, coming across. In fact, that was the uh, Tower Bridge in London. Um, and that was the end of the 2017 uh, World Championships. This, I know there are some people in the audience who probably will recognize this. This is a fantastic event in India called Satara Hills. It runs from that small town city in uh, India, it's about five hours drive, maybe four hours drive now as the road has been improved from uh, Mumbai to a place called Satara. And at the top of a hill is a unique World Heritage Site based around the flowers. And when I was involved in that in 19, uh, sorry, in 2014, uh, they had 1,500 runners. And it basically is a half marathon from the city up and down that road. They now have, and I stand corrected, about 5,000 runners each year. And it sells out in three hours. And it's one of the most beautiful roads you'll ever run on. Uh, it winds up uh, to this plateau with the flowers and uh, obviously winds back down again. Uh, there's a lot of history on it, and the community have benefited entirely from this. It was put on by basically doctors and a lawyer in the community, and the work that they have done for that community is unbelievable. They've got a trim track there. They've refurbished the, the area up by the old castle. They repainted this whole wall. There's now a, a permanent runner's viewpoint and uh, water uh, area there and so on. So great work done within there. They're, they are our AIMS event. Um, and as I say, they sell out. It's one of, as I understand it, the most famous races in, uh, in that part of India. And the one at the bottom here is actually the Mandela Marathon, uh, sorry, not Mandela, the Soweto Marathon, Soweto Southwestern Township outside uh, uh, Johannesburg in South Africa, and the home of Winnie Mandela, Nelson Mandela, um, O.R. Tambo was there. Very historic, but the big thing with uh, the Soweto Marathon is the community interaction. You run along the streets and the community come out um, and support like very few other events around the world. So each of race is unique, not just because of it being a race, but where it is held, how it is held, the interaction of the community, uh, etc. Aim for races that best suit the current situations. The situation in any country and in any um, uh, in any environment changes year to year. So what works today uh, or is required today may not work or may not be required tomorrow. The search is for the optimum for now. But you obviously need to have a vision, you know, and that vision determines who you're going to have involved in the, in the race, in the race organization, um, being who are the stakeholders. And sometimes there are obviously political stakeholders, there are religious stakeholders, uh, heritage of the country, 
there, there's obviously has to be financial and there's the geographical. Uh, the location, what is the purpose of the event? What are the resources available? That all impacts on how you're going to organize it. Um, dates and time, Friday in Middle East is generally accepted as the race day, Saturday now and again, whereas um, South Africa, it's uh, Saturday in some provinces and Sunday in other provinces. Is it a morning? Well, this is weather dependent quite often, morning or night. Um, the, in Qatar, the holding of the World Championships at night was uh, probably our first, but it, it certainly had benefit to the runners. Runners discipline, that's also quite interesting. Um, I promise you that in Soweto and South Africa, the runners discipline is not great. Um, but I've, I've been in India, we have a, a Navi Mumbai half marathon. And the first year I was involved in that, the barricades, the promised barricades or fencing never turned up and I was, absolutely concerned about what would happen at the start. Um, over and above the, the concern of the fencing not being there was that uh, Kepler Dev was uh, the celebrity. And if you know cricket and you know India, um, this man attracts a mass of fans and uh, so when he was there, I, just, I was just very concerned about what would happen with people wanting to have selfies with them and so on. Well, we put a rope down one side to try and control uh, the, the masses that were going to come there. And <laughs> people came, they stood, very disciplined, the gun went and off they went and a few stopped there and had their selfie with Kepler and uh, everything was fine. I had not seen that level of discipline in a road race in South Africa ever. So different, different compliance, different manipulation, uh, people who will try and cheat all of those depend on the society and the community that you're working with. Uh, how people queue. Some people queue very orderly. Others, and then COVID, were supposed to. Others don't. So all of these aspects fit in. Will there be theft? And in some countries, not so much in Asia, theft is a big thing. And it's not just... Uh, it's, it's not necessarily because you know, it, it comes from poverty. It comes from uh, the situation within the country. So how you handle that also involves what sort of authorities, what sort of security forces, what sort of additional um, measures you have to put in place. Uh, this respect, tech savvy. Some countries are incredibly tech savvy and with COVID, you can do everything on the phone or on your watch. Um, others aren't and we have to do things manually. Um, so COVID screening has to be done manually for some people within, within a country. All of these will impact on how you're going to organize the event. There's the Satara one giving you an idea of the numbers that actually climb that hill. This is Lagos. Uh, this is my security, by the way, this man here, Yusuf Ali, uh, Olympian, 1980 Olympian and African long jump. He and his friends, this guy's uh, hammer thrower. Uh, this one, a 400 meter. These are all track and field athletes whose passion it is to organize road races, which I find quite, uh, uh, you know, quite a change. This is in, uh, I, I believe this is in Oman um, for 
the uh, organization of the Muscat Marathon. New York, here you can see the start. Notice the, this is the ladies' start, obviously, and notice the big gap to the mass start behind. So different cultures, different ways. Organizational technology is different. If I look at the scaffolding that, uh, that we put up in South Africa or in, um, in UAE, and I compare that with the cane lashing that is used in India, um, or the different sort of barriers that are used, some places don't even have portaloos. They construct their own portaloos for the um, for the race. Uh, computing and Wi-Fi. These are all things that vary so dramatically and will impact on our on how we organise the race. Sorry, there's uh, financial. India. South Africa probably have four or five different levels and uh, status or levels, layers of, um, of financial and economy. You know, in, in Nigeria, there are incredibly rich people and there are incredibly uh, poor people. And we've got to find what level we're actually targeting at and how we're going to make that work. And then the athletic structure. What authority does the athletic structure have? How deep does it go? And what is its history in, in road events? A lot of federations were formed primarily for track and field and have little history in road running. So we tend to then take a track and field approach to the road running. And next thing we know, we have 12 timekeepers, three line judges, seven referees. And for some reason, they're all accumulating around the finish. And we're not doing ourselves as a sport uh, anything beneficial because we are seen as being part of the problem, not part of the solution. And of course, there is a learning to have. If you haven't organized a road race, then you know, you're learning from scratch. And so hopefully part of this, and hopefully we can have the interactions that will share the experience and come up with better practice. So we need as an athletic structure to be going out and passing the message on that we are there to provide a service and welcome people into our sport, into our family as partners, as stakeholders in there. And I think we tend to go in with uh, maybe a bit too much authority um, in many cases. Um, what authority have you been given by your country in terms of athletics? In South Africa, it's very clear. Um, there is only one athletics federation and it runs all things that are athletics. So that's mountain running, trail running, uh, road running, ultra running, and no one is allowed to put it on. In some provinces, even the police will turn around and say, you can't have an event unless it's passed by and sanctioned by the Athletics Federation. Exceptions are up to 5Ks or 8Ks now um, so that the, the church can hold a fun run. And there are clear definitions on what a fun run is. There are no prizes. Um, you can have results, but there is no reward for performances. So depending on the size of your event will depend uh, on the structure you, you choose. And, you know, there are various structures. And I'm going to try and just sort of go through some ideas. There, again, there is no correct answer. So a small local club event uh, would probably have 
uh, athletic sanction from the, the local um, federation. Uh, they would be providing referees, officials. They will approve the rules and they will approve the date. The host organization has a chair, sponsors give input, local municipalities give input, there are volunteers and members um, who will handle the marshalling on the day, the water tables on the day, and then there are professionals. There would have to be, um, in our country, in South Africa, there has to be a safety officer, there has to be a medical plan, so there has to be a medical officer, uh, there will be a timing company um, if, if we're going to have any reasonable any number, um, any race that is up to about a thousand, five hundred to a thousand is probably going to do a manual timing system. Um, whereas when you get above that, you're going to start bringing in technology um, nowadays because it's cheap enough to do. Uh, somewhere around about that 500 to a thousand. Again, it depends on the depends on the distance of the race. You know, 500 people in the 10k will have 60 finishers a minute at peak. Uh, 500? No, the 500 would have 30 uh, finishers per per minute at a peak time. A thousand would have 60. Per minute, and you can handle that if you've got a wide enough uh, finish area and a long enough finish area. But when you start getting two thousand, uh, the numbers are coming across the line too fast, generally speaking. So you bring in a timing company, typically with chips, which we will discuss uh, later on. If it was a marathon, however, and you've got five hundred you're probably looking at something like 12 runners per minute at peak. That's very easy to, to handle. What's the objective? Is it a, a low key or is it an international mass event? This sort of structure wouldn't work for an international mass event. Uh, the level of competition, is it a club? Is it open? Is it mass? Is it national? Is it international? And so the structure changes due to that. Is it self-liquidating? Is it purely a case of runners paying enough to cover the cost of the race? Um, you know, what is the political um, impact on the race? So uh, an event that is organized by, uh, or sorry, that is, organized to bring tourism and so on, again, would not work on this sort of level. When you're designing the initial structure, try and look at where are you going to be five years or 10 years ahead so that you can pick a structure that can be changed because the structure will generally require a constitution and uh, regulations of some sort. So you want to be able to make those changes as the event grows. So if the objective is to have an AIMS level event, don't organize it based on a small local club event structure to start with. Get the bodies in place that allow you to grow. So one of the larger events, the very first thing is to separate out the policy makers from the local organization. These are the people that are doing the technical, the, the hands-on, the day-to-day -day, um, questions and decision-making. These are the people that are being brought on board either because of the influence they can have. For instance, uh, last weekend's event had the uh, prime minister as the guest of order. So, of course, closing various roads, getting police out wasn't a problem. <laughs> if it comes from the prime minister's office, it's easy to do. So you set up your board and your trust based on 
what you're trying to achieve and you invite people there that have influence, are good policy makers and good professional uh, vision. The sort of people you could be looking at is the city, tourism, athletics. This is where your national athletics could have a, a, a seat on the board. Other influencers, you know, put on a, a person from broadcast. Sponsors may have some sort of influence in here. But be careful of that, because if the sponsor changes, you've got a problem of handling that particular sponsor. Down more at the local organizing level, you will have your chair, but you will also have perhaps your consultants, bringing in a technical consultant, bringing in a marketing consultant. And again, you'll definitely have uh, or should have the Athletics Federation, but this person will be much more hands-on, a technical official, uh, someone with experience in there. Uh, professionals, you would nowadays in South Africa, since the FIFA World Cup soccer, um, we've, we've got something called the Safety and Sport Act, 2010 and so we have to have a safety officer we have to have a medical officer medical director um, and we have to have plans that go with that we would bring in traffic officials and you'd bring in maybe your subcontractors be that on registration be that on marketing be that on even timing depending how you structure this out um, to move this, so I can see down the bottom. Let me just move this to the top. I can't. Okay. Um, come back a bit. So then you separate out into smaller sections. And so you would probably have your event into marketing of the event, promotion of the event, eventing. In other words, what happens around the event um, that might be an expo it might be uh, an after party such as they had last weekend and this is the core for me and i think everyone that's on this call is the technical good race aspect and that is a separate section it doesn't operate totally in isolation it has to link into these other uh, portions but this is what we are saying we're organizing we're organizing a road race and this is the key part that we need to get correct if we get this correct then you have a successful event and everything else that is added on meets the priorities and the desires of what we're trying to achieve does that make some sort of uh, sense? Uh, just picking up a couple of questions here while I see them. Can AIMS conduct a marathon without seeking the member federation's approval of that country? Actually, it works in the, in the reverse. For our, an event to be recognized by AIMS, the member federation must sanction it on the application form. Now, that might be member federation at district level or national level. Recently, the National Federation had a meeting with sports commissioner's office, and now they made it mandatory for all road races, events, needs a sanction letter from local athletics before a permit is issued. Okay, um, I'm not sure which country that comes from, but that is, that is great news in my opinion. And it gives the Federation, uh, it's from Malaysia. Um, it's from Malaysia. Great, and I think that's fantastic. It gives the Federation standing and credibility, you know? So I think that's, that's good. That seems to be the questions. There is another question so, from Mr. Sorry. 
Uh, there yes. is another question from Mr. Satish Uchil from India. Yeah. Uh, I, I read it for you. Uh, I wish to know when AIMS takes the membership of any marathon. Why don't they specify that the race should be under the affiliation of respective federation of the country? In India, many marathons are conducted without information of federation with an excuse that is approved by AIMS. Okay, I think, as I say, I think it's uh, going the incorrect way round because I'm presuming that AIMS are fulfilling the, that there is a, a local or a national federation approval. I know that that is the way that they, um, they say that they, they are structured. So uh, let's take Satara. Satara, I think, went to the local federation and the local federation said they are sanctioning. Now, in, in various places, the federations are structured differently, I'm sure. In South Africa, there is Athletics South Africa, and then there are uh, 17 uh, provinces, each of whom operate for that region. So the provincial, if I was wanting a race in Cape Town, I would go to Western Province and get their signature. And that is deemed to be national signature. So I think it's on, you know, Ames is probably not aware of exactly how each country is structured, but as long as there is a national or, or district federation signature on that application, they would accept it. They wouldn't get involved in the politics of a particular country. Does, does that answer the question? Can I yes. come in, please? Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, it is also uh, answer, Mr. Maybe, maybe it is also answer, Mr. Falson question, uh, the senior ITO. Uh, so, can AIMS conduct a marathon without seeking the MF's approval of that? So, cannot, yeah? Cannot, in, in, yes. in, but it, it's been put the wrong way around because Ames doesn't go into a country and say, we are going to have an event there. The event goes to Ames and says, please, we want to be, we want to be a member. And I think that's the point that's being lost here. Ames is not going into countries and saying, uh, okay, you must, you must be, uh, uh, we must have an event here. So it's up to the event to get the sanction from the local federation or national federation and for that to be signed on the membership application and then AIMS office will look at it and see and if there is a signature on there they're not going to question that signature does does that help i see there is a hand up or is it Yes, uh, yes, don't worry. I'm 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 Murugesu from Malaysia. Uh, Hello. I uh, sorry, I what I'm Murugesu from Malaysia. Regarding this AIMS uh, sanction of of this marathon in India, because I used to do a, a lot of measurements in India. The thing is that the local organizers there they have connection with AIMS officials. So they just use the name of these officials to organize their event without going through the National Federation. That's what I see happens in India. It is not AIMS getting involved or AIMS sanction event. There's no AIMS sanction event run in India. It's only the locals, they make use of these uh, AIMS officials name to organize such events. Okay. so. To the best of my knowledge, um, at present, there is only one AIMS measure in India. Um, there are measurers, uh, but there is only one AIMS 
measure um, in India present now. Yeah, it, it's, it is Amir, and he is also an event organizer. Right now, there is a difference between an aims measurement and an aims event. So AIMS is the Association of International Marathons and Distance Races. And to be uh, an AIMS member event, you have to have the course measured by a World Athletics or AIMS A or B grade measure. And the standard of organization needs to be able to meet athletic standards, which is why there is a requirement on the membership form for um, a signature from district or national or provincial, whatever you call it, um, federation. That is how the race becomes a AIMS member. If a race has a measurement done by a mayor, then it will be a certified race. That does not make it an AIMS race. Is, is, is that clear? Does that help? So I, yeah, can it's give, clear, it's clear. I, could give, I can give any race a certificate saying that it was measured to AIM standards and world athletic standards. But that's what the certificate does. It does not give uh, the right of that race to claim AIMS membership or world athletics standing at all. To be an AIMS member, you then have to apply. You use the AIMS certificate, that's one aspect, and you use the member federation. And that is where the member federation has the power to say, I'm sanctioning your race or I'm not sanctioning your race. And obviously one would not sanction a race that you didn't have any control over, one would hope. Because that is, we are the policing of the standard of the event. That is what you're sanctioning. So the sanctioning itself doesn't normally come with a cost. The cost is in providing the service to the sport, to the event. Does that, does that make sense? And typical around the world, typical is that there is a percentage of an entry fee or there is a lump sum and a percentage of an entry fee plus uh, something for the technical officials that are on, on duty of the day. That is, you know, there are many, many variations, but that should be a standardized thing within your country so that everyone knows if they want to have a sanctioned event, this is the, uh, the way it is handled. Are we, are we clear on that? Uh, okay. There, uh, there was another hand up and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure where it is and I see. Some questions, Ria Stuti. Maybe you can. Yes, help. yes. Uh, there is a question, but but before that, I think Mr. Satis, Satis Uchil from India, would like to ask question. Mm -hmm. Mr. Satis. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nuri sir. Uh, my point is that though it is mentioned very clearly in the AIMS rules and regulation that the federation signature is required, but we have come across so many cases so many cases where they have not approached the uh, federation and they have got the approval from the aims there are so many cases so it is not being uh, strictly followed uh, in aims I, I suppose okay i mean that is certainly something that if you want uh, to to bring up uh, with me um afterwards we can look at how you could check that. It's fairly simple. You just go to the AIMS secretary and say, are these events proper members of your... In fact, if you go on to the AIMS website, you will see the list of member events. So if they're listed there, 
then it is saying that there was an application put in that had a course certificate for a certified group <laughs> and had an application form submitted that had a signature from a federation on it and that they have paid their fees. So, you know, it should be very easy to check. If you're saying there are other places that are using a certificate, yes, but are they, are they claiming AIMS membership or are they purely claiming that that race was measured by an AIMS measurer? And no. I think that's where there may be confusion. No, no, they are, they are clearly claiming that it is AIMS approved marathon race not uh, the road measurement certification is altogether different uh, but well, I'm, uh, sure. They say... I know I've done... I'm sure i've, yes, I've done said many... that we can we can always in approach India. games we will do that yeah i'm sure that's something that we we can talk offline in, in specific cases because i don't think that's correct to be done here and i can assist you in um, putting you in touch with and solving some of these problems. Thank you. Let's Thank see. you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so please, at the end, just stay on and, uh, you know, we will we will create a, a little meeting on that. Yeah. Uh, there is one more feedback from Mr. Satyo Haryo of Indonesia. Uh, there is regulation in Indonesia which requiring any sport event must obtain sanction from the relevant sport federation. The sanction should be obtained before the authority give permit to the organizer to hold the event. However, sometimes the authority disregard the sanction requirement. Thank you. Yeah, well, that's, that's very interesting to note and presumably this is where the federation will take it up on a more political level with, um, <laughs> the local authorities um, and say, wait a minute, here's what's been agreed. It's not happening. Please, can you, you know, please, can we get it back online? And uh, and that to me is the, the way ideally it should be in countries. But, you know, in America, for instance, anyone can put on a race. Anyone can put on a race. Anyone can be a timer, you know? And when we get into the whole thing about timing, you know, what is the status of, let's say, a championship or race results? They're not official timers. And that is what we as a federation have to offer. So we must be very careful in how we sanction events and what we're offering. Because that is our trump card. Yeah. Thanks for that uh, interaction. It's it's good, and I, I think the more of that we can do, the better. Um, okay, let's try and move on. So, as as the race gets bigger, there are more and more, um, you know, portfolios and things to have. So, for instance, this comes out of one in uh, in the Middle East. Uh, there's a general manager, the, the lady there, she's got an office assistant, a secretary. Uh, this organization runs three events in a year. Um, they have someone specially to do all the authority liaisons. Obviously, they have an accountant. And you can see sales manager. They're selling entries to the non-government organizations, to corporates and schools. Uh, you've got your race manager who has uh, assistance. It's got a course manager, a logistics manager. How are you going to get your barriers or fences out on the road? What time do they have to be out? He's basically the storeman. He buys the stuff in and holds it in store and organizes it to be signed out. Everything from uh, Marshall's bib to... You know, uh, he will organize for the painting of the blue line on the road. Uh, you've got the timing system, which in this particular case 
is an indoor, uh, uh, it's part of the organization. They don't hire out. They will bring in experts from uh, the head office, but they actually own the timing system and they will rent it out to other events. You've got your race team across here, uh, the marketing, communications, the social media side of things, they've got PR. Uh, they call it a village registration team. This is uh, basically where they're taking entries and they go out for three months before and do it. So you can see this is a full-time um, year-round organization doing at least three major events. Three of them are AIMS events. Uh, one of them may go for a label one day soon. Um, yeah, it's, it's well structured and it's built up over a number of years. And just, it's not up here, but the policy board includes, uh, the chairman is the prince, um, they've got the city on there, they've got the tourism on there. So again, it's what are they trying to achieve? Where's the go? You know, the build the system. But if you start with a small club system and you're trying then to bring in um, a policy board, it becomes quite hard. So try and look five years ahead, maybe 10 years ahead. And realistically, any, any event that wants to be, for instance, a world label event, the minimum if you've got everything working for you is basically three years and five years is a realistic, five to 10 years is a realistic um, vision to have, to have a label event. And of course you have to start at bronze and you can go up to gold. Uh, platinum is much harder to get into and probably takes another four or five years. Okay. Even within the volunteer section, this is just a volunteer manager. And again, they've got an assistant. Obviously, you always have a 2IC for key portfolios in case someone something happens to someone. Uh, they have their different areas that they need their uh, volunteers for. And they start a recruitment system. And that recruitment may be if you volunteer at one event, you get your membership card. If you volunteer at three events, you get a discount card for going to local shops because you're now valued. So you're creating a, a strategy, a recruitment strategy and a reward strategy for your key volunteers, because your volunteer who comes along and works at your village three, four, five times, he is potentially the, the next person to head up the village section. So it's great to have a, a far more encompassing way of bringing in friends of the marathon or uh, run run Prague or run Czech um, have this sort of system where people get advantages by being and recognition by being uh, volunteers. And of course, every event should have some sort of strategy for uh, rewarding the volunteer on the day. Volunteers now mean different things in different countries. I mean, in China, uh, you will find that there is medical assistance along the road every 100 meters. That's 420 people who are reporting any medical situations along the road. China has those sort of numbers and one of its biggest resources is people. So that works. In South Africa, you would never get that. A, a volunteer isn't a volunteer. He's actually someone who is paid a certain amount. 
And I think it changes again on culture as to what Sitara, uh, the, the Sitara uh, half marathon, the community come out and work for free. Why? Because they know that they're getting something back from the event into the community. You know the hotels. You can't get a you can't get a bed in Satara on the race weekend. And there's even been talk of having two weekends, you know, for for Satara. So volunteers work in different ways, and you need to be aware of that when you're uh, recruiting them. The success from team leaders. Really, that's where the success comes from, is how these key people react to the, um, uh, to the volunteers. And each one of these blue dots or, or areas has a team leader in it. You know, bus parking has a team leader. And you can see automatically that this is also starting to form your communication structure. So that again, there is no correct structure for a race, but it needs to be something in my mind that allows you to um, build it up as the event grows. So what seems logical and easy on day one is not necessarily the way you should go. <coughs> Excuse me. The technical race portfolios, there's your race director. You may have a consultant. I mean, that's what I'm doing uh, for most of my life these days is being a consultant. Um, and often the course measurer, course measurer is a good consultant because they know that course intimately. Uh, assistant race manager, and then you've got the course manager who looks after the water stations, the barriers, the fencing you're putting up, the start, the finish, etc. Your logistics teams, I've gone through that, the hiring of tents, uh, making sure there's electricity there, making sure there's an electrician on site. What time do the refreshment tables and resources need to be in places? The timing system tends to be a subcontractor um, and would work independently uh, to a large degree. Uh, the route team, and this is quite interesting, we'll go through this. The route team look at the road closures and obviously we'll work with the liaison uh, person. Uh, direction and assistance, uh, so your, your marshals, your uh, signage, and so on that they're going up along there. Um, and the control room, because each your event needs a joint operations committee, um, but also the race itself, the actual venue. Our venue is the entire route. And so we need eyes on that route and we need to be able to get emergency people onto that route and we need an overview, someone that knows where the start is, is the, the, the lead runner is and where the back runner is at all times during the event. And obviously the bigger the event, the bigger and more complex that becomes. Um, horizontal or vertical. So, Many race organizers will have one person doing the water points and he does the whole water points. I, I'm not a great particular fan of, of that approach. I prefer a vertical approach where the race route is split up into sectors, three kilometers, five kilometers, really depending on how many intersections you have and so on. And my sector head looks after everything in that sector. Kilometer marks, making sure they're in place, making sure the signage is in place, it's all marshals are in place, the water point in that sector, everything in there. Now he is assisted by the logistics manager who makes sure that there is a van or truck that goes in there that has been packed in the way that uh, 
everything that you're taking off is in the order that the truck is going. So it might be kilometer mark number one comes off. So it's packed last. Uh, then there is a water table. So your two tables come off next. Or then there is a, um, then there is a, a particular sign or a splitter point or something like that. And so each item is taken off the back of the truck in reverse order to the way the truck is going. And I'm responsible for everything between kilometer three and kilometer six. And why that works so well is I can go up and down there and I can see what's missing and I can radio through. And if I've got a table captain, that table captain's in connect in uh, contact with me and everything is happening in that area. And I can probably solve all my problems using the resources within that area. If I do a horizontal layout, then if I've got a problem at water table one, I go to water table one, but now I've got another problem, water table 10. It takes me so long to get to water table 10, particularly because I've already closed roads for runners that, you know, it just doesn't work as well, in my opinion. So have a look at how you're splitting your route up. And if you've do, been doing it horizontally, give some consideration to whether you would do it vertically, in which case, under the route team, you would have um, different sectors, sector one, sector two, sector three. Sector uh, starts and finish would be sectors by themselves. Here is a sector system, sector head for five kilometer lap, sector head for five to 10, uh, the sector head for, at the sports club on beach road for the kids race. Lead cars is a sector by itself. You know, it's a, it's a portfolio by itself. Someone that looks after the lead cars, make sure they're there, make sure the timing on the clocks goes, make sure the referee is in there if that's the option. Personally, I prefer a referee to be on a motorbike. And by the way, I have a, uh, now I've just developed a, a clock, which it goes on a motorbike on the rider and can actually be used to show the runners which direction to turn, which side of the road to be on to be running the shortest line. And that helps us where there is no blue line because the city don't like a blue line painted down or we don't have the money to do that. It also has a camera on the back, which means we can stream either to the disaster management, the VOC, or the jock, uh, or in, indeed to broadcast or to social media. So you've constantly got the lead runners with no car or television bike or whatever in, in between uh, causing confusion. Uh, so the sector heads are the people that do the majority of the race organization meeting with the race technical and management. So there's your course manager, here's all your sector heads. So that grouping can meet by themselves and sort out the route. You then start bringing in the various other um, portfolios uh, into a bigger meeting. And so this structure works quite well. There's your medical, your volunteers, road closure, signage, et cetera. But this is quite a big race, um, and this is only the technical side of it. This race technical manager and probably the course manager uh, would also work with the, and the signage manager will also work with the eventing side of the thing. Yeah, everyone happy?
So in a sector, this is Muscat. This was a, a marathon Muscat 2018. Um, you can see the purple is the route. And the orange is the route. And you can see it's there's one sector. And there was actually, this is a, a golf course and this area here um, is a, a residential area. Um, these two areas here, and there were some VIPs in there which had to have 24 hour access and security and so on, which you work around. And it's much easier for a sector head to work around that sort of um, restriction than it is for someone standing at the start finish area to handle it. So there's sector four, sector three, sector two, sector one. And um, that, that had a half marathon, a 10K, a 5K, and uh, a marathon, full marathon. These are access points so that AC one to seven so that we could get logistics in there without going along the route. There's turn points and so on. Okay, so there's a sort of sectors, portfolios, event, prize giving, root sectors, logistics, purchase. An individual sector. Um, this was the one that had uh, the start and finish on it. And there you can see Marshall signage, kilometer marks, port -a -loos, spectators, entertainment points. These all belong to that sector head. He must make sure that they're there that they're operating fine. Uh, spectator and entertainment points are not encroaching on the shortest line, etc. Security, residential traffic. You know, it's all very well having a, a, a race route, but I believe part of our obligation is also to make sure that we uh, allow other traffic to flow as freely as possible. So anything that goes on in that sector is that individual sector head's responsibility. And obviously this person needs two to three months work on this thing, either part-time or you can bring in full-time on it. Here you can see it's 0.1 kilometer to 2.5. In other words, immediately after the start to 2.5 and 7.5 to 10. So a total of five kilometers of race route, but that's out and back. So it's only 2.5 kilometers that the person has to travel. And ideally, uh, these are either on scooters or motorbikes or uh, even pedal bikes. So they can get there and back in a very short period of time. And you don't do it in a car because a car just adds to the traffic problems on the road. Ideally, we should all have closed roads, but we know at club event level and so on, that's pie in the sky. Sector documentation, they need to uh, provide all the documents for that. And, and the documents should be built up for the race. So sectors, root sector lend themselves to easier documentation and graphics. Information instructions need to be there, it can be clearer. Every person working in a sector should have a mandate. Now, that's, that's the ideal, but it takes a couple of years to build that up. So we should have a race manual, particularly um, with the more established events that we have. You then know exactly what you're ordering for that sector, because the order comes from the sector head to say, I need three kilometer boards, I need five signs pointing left, six pointing straight ahead, um, so on and so forth. And that can all be documented. And if it's in a loose leaf, um, loose leaf folder, then you can take it out. If the route changes, you take out one junction, you put in the new junction. 
If things change or requirements change, you can simply add or remove sheets. This gives you an idea of one of the sectors. This is a diagram showing the emergency, um, the emergency routes in and out of the area. How do we get our ambulance in or out? How do we get people out of here 24 hours a day? You know, um, you can see there is a, a dirt road here that we were using to access in here. Obviously, if runners are going in both directions on this road, it's quite restricted to get in here. There was another access point up, up here, which came from the golf course side. But this is how we got people across. From this whole area here, there was a point here where when it's quiet, we can get a car across and out and around that way. So sector documentation, here's the checklist uh, for draw up each junction and place in the location for the marshal direction of the runners group, what time their first dump runner is going to be there, what the last time is, you document everything out. Check the task list, it creates the timeline for setup. Generates, out of the task list, you're generating the number of volunteers you need. You generate the resources you require. So this task list becomes very much the, um, the initiative or the seed for everything else that comes after it. And when there's, you know, there's no such thing as a ideal or a perfect event. So after the event, you simply review against this and add in what went wrong and correct it that way. I'm a big believer that anyone who thinks they've had the perfect event needs to retire. Um, the reason being that there is no such thing as a perfect event and we can always improve on things and things always go wrong. So, you know, if we're honest about our debriefs, then we will always start improving and something else will go wrong on the day, unfortunately. The big question as to whether or not the event was a success is really, did the runner notice? Did the end user notice the error? And if not, then it was a successful event. You know? Okay. Any comments, any questions? Let's have a, a, a gap on that at the present moment. Yes, there is a question from yes. for, for the previous topic about the sanction, and this is the fifth sanction. The question from Mr. Hario of Indonesia. Let me read the question. The Indonesia Athletic Federation is conducting research on performing sanction and issuance of permit. We are also establishing communication strategy to deliver this to the organizer, running club, and public. We are struggling in determining proper fee for doing the sanction. Any suggestion on parameter that can be used to determine the sanction fee? Thank you. Okay, I, I think, you know, from my point of view, um, the one that has worked very well is, is the South African one. Um, so let me say how, how the South African athletics are structured and how they make their money um, to survive. But remember, it is a very... Um, it's a very structured, highly structured, it is totally club oriented scenario. So I've told you about the license number, which becomes your race number, which is valid for a year, which the National Federation get a sponsor for. So National Federation have a sponsor along the top of the number. And that's where they make their money. They then sell the at cost 
uh, the number to the provinces or the district federations, and the district federations sell those on at a profit to the members. So that means that they're getting some money in. Now, events have to apply for a date on the fixture list. And in applying, they will pay a sum of money. It's, um, what can I give you a guideline on? It's about $50. Um, it's about $50 application fee. But in real life, that would be something like the cost of a night's accommodation, if that helps at all, because I think we need to look at buying power. The $50, a dollar in Africa is different from a dollar in Japan, you know, <laughs> uh, very much different. <laughs> uh, so you need it to be a reasonable amount to process that application. Having been given a date, uh, they have to put a deposit fee down, which again is uh, reasonably substantial. That deposit fee prevents them from cancelling that event because they've taken a, uh, a date on the fixture list. Okay, now the event goes ahead. They are charged 10% of the entry fee. And that's a, a standard thing. There was a move to move it up to 15, but it was heavily resisted. So most provinces will charge 10% of the entry fee. So if you've got a thousand people um, at $10 a time, uh, then you're going to get $1,000 to the Federation. On top of that, there is uh, the technical officials. And I'm going to be perfectly blunt. I think we abuse our technical officials in the sport um, and work on their good nature because I don't think they are paid for you know, correct, uh, a correct amount for the work they're putting in. But that is something that you probably already have in place. And typically we would appoint a chief referee, um, two referees to each distance of a club event. Uh, and the club who are also supposed to have qualified technical officials are supposed to provide three timekeepers, uh, a line judge and a starter. So those are roughly the, uh, the minimum number of people that we would have. And the club also identified a jury of appeal from technical officials that are coming to their race. Um, when you move to national, then all of those or a provincial championships, then all of those officials are appointed by the local federation or national federation. And they, they are paid, uh, as I say, to be there um, and given travel normally. Plus, they will get um, normally some sort of T-shirt or kit and they will be given some form of food or assistance, particularly for marathons, which will tend to have a five-hour cutoff. I don't know if that, if that helps. So for, for me, the, that is the sanctioning fee. There are other countries that simply charge a single one-off fee. Um, and will sanction the event and then charge so much for the uh, officials on the day. It's really open and I'm sure amongst us we could chat quickly about other things that, uh, you know, other things that uh, are, are used, other systems that are used. Anyone like to volunteer alternates?
Has anyone alternates on that? No. Look, the, the what what do we get from an from sanctioning an event? And I would strongly encourage that federations do not take on the organization of an event. In other words, um, we need to be the overview. We need to be the people making sure that the standard is achieved and maintained. If the Federation organize an event, there is a conflict of interest in my mind. We need to be able to um, look at the event holistically criticize and assist in that event. So um, I, would, I would say that the Federation shouldn't be in there. Therefore, what are we offering them? We're offering them to assist them to run an event to a credible internationally recognized standard. That is what we're offering them. And we're offering them the officials to do that, to have their results recognized and internationally ranked. We're, we're offering them technical assistance and guidance. And that is what we are selling to them. How you get the money back from them, that's going to depend on your culture, the way you're set up, et cetera. Does that help in any way? We must be independent in my mind. Okay, we've got an hour. Will we go through some of this? Or do we want a five minute break? Yes, sure. sure. I think let's have a five minute break for everyone. Um, so that we can just adjust it. If there are questions or comments, please feel free. It's very hard doing this on a, <laughs> on a remote, uh, you know, on a remote basis, because you don't get the interaction of the uh, people in the faces and, and so on. Yes, I know already two questions. Okay, after the yes. break. Okay, so I'm going to take a, a few minutes. I'm going to put a jersey on because it's actually very cold here. <laughs> yeah, please. Watson, how are you?
Murugesh too. How are you? Yes, sir. Fine, fine. How are you? <laughs> good, 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 good. I'm fine. Uh, I'm how fine. is my brother? Ah, uh, he's good. He's doing good. He's doing good. Ah, uh, he's not coming in today, ah? Uh? No, he's not coming in today. Uh, actually, on uh, one on Saturday, she won, ah. Mm. It has been always uh, misquoted by our guy. Correct. Uh, Ames don't sanction any any event. It 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 because of our friend, eh, the co-organizer with him. So, uh, his wife. No, there. Uh, so there was an issue last time in Bangladesh. Yeah. Oh. Sorry, give the peso man. I'm not any peso. Yeah. Okay. Eh? Yeah, yeah, that's why I didn't open the topic there. Yeah, yeah, but hmm. so hi. Uh, let's just see. I want to see if I can share that with you. Just a little aside. I went for a long run. I still try and run um, on Saturday, and look what I found. Can you see this photo on the screen? Yes, Jakarta. Yeah, yeah. Jakarta. Jakarta. <laughs> Jakarta is across. So okay. there you are. Oh, it's a spoon uh, and a fork and a spoon. And I almost did it live at Jakarta uh, today. So unfortunately, that's a restaurant that's closed. But I was running and I came across this and I couldn't believe that there is a Jakarta in South Africa. There you are. Ah. And, and it's very near two very good wine farms. So I thought I would just share that with you. So. <laughs> Jakarta uh, restaurant yeah. in Africa. Yes. In okay. South Africa. South Africa, sorry. Yeah. The owner in must be Cape, Indonesian. It's actually a place called Cape Town. So. Uh, let me just stop that and see if I can share it again and get back to the PowerPoint. Is that good again? Hopefully. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, if we can carry on, uh, we'll look at what the world athletic rules and the rules of the official are. Uh, a bit on COVID and viral assessment. I mean, I consider that a moving target. A very frustrating moving target. Uh, by the way, Cape Town Marathon is about to do an announcement tonight, and I think we're going to hear our first major event uh, in South Africa uh, being allowed, probably with 10,000 runners. As I say, last week in Tanzania, there was 5,000 runners. Then we'll look at course measurement. I see there are a few national and so on. Uh, and one aims course measurer on board. Um, so a little video in that, which is, and then we can see how far we get into route configuration and refreshment tables. Um, but uh, let's start there. Sorry, there were some questions. Have we have we got more questions, Rio Stuti? Yeah. Or okay, we... there are two. Uh... One is uh, how can we get the lecture script? And then, pardon me, I answer that you will share after the end of this webinar. Is that correct? Yeah, we will share. Look, I'm going to update it. This is the first time that this has been rolled out. And so, you know, there will be modifications. So we will probably hold this for a week um, while I update bits on it. And um, then it will be available, but it will be available after the, um, the whole uh, rollout. Mm -hmm. And um, also something I should say to you is, you're going to get a, a, my WhatsApp number. Um, please note that I am, it's now 12 o'clock here, so I'm significantly behind you. Um, mm -hmm. But for a week after the event, if you've got questions, let's interact. And we'll maybe try and set up a WhatsApp chat group. Riastati, you, you think that can work? 
where we can just feedback and share ideas. I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm very conscious that I'm doing all the talking. I would really like others to put their hand up and, um, you know, be involved in this. But yes, we will no. have that for about a week afterwards where we can share ideas. I've got to learn from you as well. Okay. Yeah, not a, actually we already built a WhatsApp group. So we will add you on this WhatsApp group. Ah, so you've been working in the background. Ah, yeah. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry, because I have to ask you, ask your permission to invite it, you. <laughs> okay, so I will. There's the Poppy Act coming into effect as well, you know, where you're asking permission for to talk to people, same as we have to do now with all our entries and so on. Yeah. Okay. Okay, let's move on. The other yes. one, other one, just yep. the other one is two virtual events need to be sanctioned. From from uh, Mr. Chu's uh, from Sao Me okay. of Singapore. I, I'm a, as I say, I, I'm a 100% federation man. So for me, this is my sport. This is our sport. And anyone that wants to come in and make finance or make benefit out of the, the sport must be part of the sport in some way, even if it's a stakeholder. If I had my way, I would register or accredit all the timing companies. I would ensure that they all had basic knowledge of, of uh, technical rules regarding timing. So yes, the answer is, I would say any country, any federation that can uh, create an enforced sanctioning uh, system, you must go for it. But please understand that's not a world athletics um, viewpoint. That is my viewpoint as someone involved in the sport and race organization. Yes, happy comments, disagreements? No? Okay, let's go. Uh, so the, the purpose of the rules is really the standardizing the manner and competitive environment internationally. Diversity of road races was one of the reasons uh, its world records were relatively new. And in fact, um, you may have seen the notification that came out that 50 kilometers has now been added um, to the world record distances. All road running is acceptable as a race, but to be ranked, the distance must be measured, and that must be by the uh, bicycle method, and, and not GPS, but I'll talk about that later on. Um, timing is from the gun to the finish, and must be uh, using an accepted method. Uh, the specifics worldwide rules apply. Eligibility to enter and compete is part of the rules. Behavior in the event is part of the new rules. And the comparability of the results, qualification, and records is what we're really offering that event. Uh, event to be sanctioned at provincial national level one of those two um, and for world athletics it needs to be at national level it can't be a provincial level i know that aims have accepted provincial level um, so for a label you've got to have a measurement you've got to have a standard of organization and the application needs to be um, signed off by the federation, national federation. And then someone will come along or may come along and assess that event in the year prior to you being given the label. Now, things have changed uh, quite significantly 
for this COVID year, but I expect them to go back to the same sort of basic principles for the World Label event. We should be getting an update probably next month or the month after from World Athletics on what will happen for 2022. But I think an awful lot of us are waiting to see what happens with London and New York and, and so on. Um, to become an AIMS member, we've talked about that. And just to reinforce, the process is very straightforward. I have an event. I want it to be an AIMS event. I've got to have it measured by an AIMS World Athletic Level A or Level B measurer. I've got to go to my federation and have them sign my membership application. That application goes into AIMS. AIMS should therefore uh, check that everything is in place. They will then send an invoice. The invoice will then be paid. The current fees, I, I think, are 300 for an associate member um, and 800 for a full membership, dollars, US dollars. Um, an associate member is a member who has ha had the event running under three years. A full member of the event has been running for three years or more. Um, what else? The, the event must have been held at least once before you can become a AIMS member. Uh, so if we go to the technical rules, and of course the technical rules, as we all will know, um, have been totally rewritten under the World Athletics from the IWF. And I'm sure many of you, like myself, are still at times grappling to find the correct section of the handbook because the handbook now contains the constitution, governance laws, um, the whole gambit is in that one section and it's all available downloaded from the uh, World Athletics website in PDFs. So the constitution is in section A, governance is in section B, section C is the competition rules. Um, and I'm happy to be corrected if any of this, uh, or there are sections missing that you feel are relevant. So please, by all means, uh, put a hand up and add into this. Uh, for me, the authorization officials, uh, world record requirements is in section one, section two, uh, section 1.3 is the road labels. Um, and I've made a note there that uh, this year is very special. Section 2.1 and part one, the competition rules general to track and field cross country to the whole thing. It's our guidance rules. Um, track, uh, section two to five, track and field, indoor, outdoor, which we're not going to cover the walking rules. And then section seven, uh, basically rule 55 is the road rule. Now, obviously intent from these follows through into here. And I don't think we, uh, I don't think at local level, we teach enough on intent of a rule because intent of the rule is actually more important in adjudicating the rule to my mind than the rule itself. Uh, then section D is doping control, um, which is playing a never greater part in our in road running um, and I'm glad to say that the athletics integrity unit is doing a great job even despite COVID in, in that. Then athletics integrity unit I think is one of the most valuable units that we've got in our sport um, because it also deals with manipulation, manipulation of results and that looks at everything from uh, gambling and uh, 
cheating in its various forms. So I, I think that is one of the big assets that we have brought into our sport. Okay. I have a, a, a view on elite contender club athletes and recreational athletes. Um, elite athletes and contender athletes, I'm going to lump together. What do I mean by contender athletes? Your event has so many prizes. Let's say the top 10 and the top three in each age group. In real reality, there are only a few people who are going to stand on that podium. Your top 10, there may be 50 people in your entire race that can make that top 10. You know? In a club event, it might be the top three that you're awarding. There's probably only 10 people that are really, in reality, going to make that uh, that. Um, area, that podium. And the same goes in age groups. So why are we applying the same rules to a person who wants to just break four hours for the marathon or 50 minutes for a 10k um, that we're applying to the people who are running 28 minutes or 26 minutes or whatever? You know, it doesn't make any sense to me. You know, they're there for different purposes. And then to some extent, if they cheat, they're cheating themselves. Um, you know, if we over-officiate, if we over-officiate, then we're actually going to turn some people off. On the other hand, do we want cheats in the sport? So the answer is no, we don't want cheats in the sport. But I like to separate out the elite and the contenders, and there are true contenders. So let's say that uh, I have a 10K race and my uh, top 10 closes at 31 minutes. Um, and my 20th person is on uh, 32.30. Then why don't I make a criteria that anyone who can beat 3230 and can prove they can beat 22, uh, 3230 becomes uh, a contender and has a different start and has a different set of rules. And in many ways, that's what happens in London. You have the elite, and we saw that photo that I put up before of the start of New York where there is a large distance between the front, the ladies who were going to go off first, and then the mass of people lying back. And I would suggest to you that as soon as you get to a race, particularly with all the COVID restrictions, this is the way we need to start introducing it into our sport at national and club level. We identify what is the true contender? And we put them up front and they go off separately or even with the space. So there's no one behind who's being disadvantaged by um, the, the, the structure of the start or how you get into the start. And uh, your elite are clear. And if you're even starting them with a separate start time, then you can say only people in that batch can, uh, can win the prizes and people apply. And you can have a board of appeal for anyone who feels that they have a particular reason, like a debut marathon runner or a debut half marathon runner. Um, like Safan Hassan was a debut half marathon runner in Denmark for the Copenhagen race, I think 2018, um, you would hardly, <laughs> you would hardly say, no, you can't come in, you don't have a qualifying time, you know, um, you put them in and let them run. My experience is that you will never have a really unfair application um, for, for that contender. 
And the reason I'm emphasizing this is because then the world athletic rules can apply 100% and 100% of the time to all of those people that are in the elite and contender. Whereas the others, the recreational, you can apply the standards uh, by intent and expectation. What does a runner expect out of the marathon? What can they reasonably expect? What can an organizer reasonably expect? Um, so you've got a bit of leniency on that. If a runner is running with his wife, is it pacing? You know, um, no, just go on and enjoy yourselves. Please uh, have a great day. Okay, so I would encourage you into that. It's not stipulated in any place but it allows you to uh, run events in parallel with each other. And we're doing that already on gender, we're doing it with disability, with the uh, um, Paralympics, which are starting of course today. Uh, we do it already with age. Age is a separate race from an open race, but an age grouper can still win an open race and it allows for different ambitions. Viral assessment, as I say, is a moving target. Now, if we are uh, planning on the worst and we implement on current, then we're more or less covered. So for instance, and again, this is where the elite and contenders start, we have a batch start for under a gun start for the contenders and the elite, but we may have rolling starts for uh, batches of 250 or something like that. Um, I believe that viral assessment is here to stay. I, I worry about the way some countries are structured and, and how they're going to handle uh, the virus once they open up again. Uh, but I think we are going to have a similar scenario with viral assessment that we have with terrorism. Terrorism, In other words, when 9-11 happened and everyone was shut down and we basically had to strip down to get onto the plane, um, you know, nowadays we're in a situation where you walk into an airport and you're monitored from start to finish. Um, there is minimal um, searching that goes on in comparison to previous and uh, we're adapting to it and our systems are adapting to it. Even now we're using thermal cameras at airports to get in whereas when we first started this viral assessment we had to stand in queues, fill in forms, each person temperature checked, that put on to the form and the form filed somewhere for six months. So I'm fairly confident that we will be using thermal cameras at perimeters of events and so on as we go along, as technology allows us. Um, some people are happy to run with their phones, in which case you can use QR codes and so on. It's definitely going to get easier, but we're not getting rid of COVID or viral assessment, as far as I can see. Uh, at worst, it will be a, a green to dark red scenario with four or five classifications. And in the worst classification, uh, we won't be allowed to have events again. But nothing is standard and each event is unique and each country is different in what they're requiring. We're currently on a 100 gathering limit for outdoors in South Africa. But what is a gathering? Is a funeral a gathering where, and you have parties where everyone wants to get together, whereas a race and a mass participation is a situation where as soon as that gun goes, I want to get as far away from my competitors and as far ahead of my competitors. But how many countries have even recognized that as yet? So 
we can't be specific in this situation over what to do. All we can say is there's a there's a, a large toolbox of ideas and concepts, and we need to innovate and uh, adapt them to our particular situation. Um, innovation and collaboration are the one thing I think we've been taught by um, by by COVID is that we. We need to um, work with people. The people that were our um, competitors can now actually be our partners in the sport. Uh, roles, recognition and the rules. Well, it varies with the different event. That actually is uh, aims. And I think, yeah, that was in Prague. Um, those are the aims members and many of those are non non federation people by that i mean they are commercial event organizers um, who are there but partner obviously with uh, the federations uh, what did they give we we are able to give this is what i think the federation that's able to give uh, it varies with the level of the race. We can appoint the technical team for championships, major events. Uh, label race, uh, the technical delegate is appointed um, and others to monitor and assess, but obviously is normally willing from the time of appointment to help clarify issues and to advise both before and during and after the event on perhaps how things can be done or would be done differently or done differently in other areas. World Athletics Office is always open to um, assist and guide. Um, they would normally ask for it to happen through uh, the member federation, but if you're a label event, there is, uh, there are people who will assist you straight away. Um, Alessio Punzi is, is in charge of road running, the road running manager at World Athletics Office and a very um, accessible person. The World Athletics website has downloads of everything on uh, the rules, on recommendations. And I must also mention the assessment tool for COVID. Um, although I find that very much a overview tool rather than a hands-on practical tool. AIMS member gained by the interaction because they have a conference every year and a half or some, and have until recently had uh, the Athens Symposium every uh, November which members can go along to. Um, and the big thing to remember is we are actually a very, very small family. I mean, the World Athletics have had 250 race organizers on one call in, in the past year and a half. And frequently there are calls with uh, various groupings within road running. Uh, so we're actually very small and be very sure that most of the problems that you have faced have been faced by someone before. So there is a whole wealth of help out there if it's wanted. Um, the World Athletics COVID-19 protocol is downloadable from the um, website. It was released mid-January 2021. I'm not sure if it's been updated as, as yet. Um, it does target world and international events, uh, but it's got good principles in it. Uh, there are three sections um, looking at the various um, organizational aspects of it. And it looks at uh, stadium events and out of stadium events. 
To be quite honest, the out of stadium events I find in all of this COVID have been, are very general and they have to be because as I say, um, everything is unique. Each event is unique. You can't compare starting in the road with uh, lining up in a, in, a, in a track. You can't compare an open field with uh, a closed perimetered area. You know, the, the tasks are completely different in each case. I do find that COVID consists of uh, uh, assessment and situations are far better when we're working with a perimeter, a fixed perimeter. Now you either create that with fencing or uh, you find a place that is walled all around, you know, a car park. We had a, car, uh, a race in a shopping mall car park at five o'clock in the morning, which was great because we could control the entrances. What are the universal basics? Use masks, sanitize, and social distance. And most require screening prior to prior to anyone um, being allowed in at the start of the race. I think we've covered most of this. We are all working on the best current information and trust. And I'm not sure what happens in your countries, uh, but we are having to trust the government. We're having to trust the medical profession in that what they say is based on best information at the time. But I spend a lot of time uh, reading other, other countries' regulations, trying to keep up on what are their high risks, um, uh, what is happening, what, how people are working around, because I think we're all really just trying to do and be the best we can be. I'm a believer in it's easier to relax your condition. So maybe you're allowed currently to have 500 groups of 500 or groups of 100, then plan on that because if you're allowed 200, it's easier to relax that situation than it is to tighten it. Um, just trying to get these in. Uh, be innovative. Look for the innovation all the time. Uh, be flex, flexible and be proactive rather than uh, reactive if you can. Research and coll collaborate with other events. We're, we're all allies in this COVID thing. Uh, new collaborations and levels for info sharing. You know, as I say, why don't we, as event organizers, why don't we bring people on board? Um, you know, we used to have three, in this one area, we had three um, event organizers and one event has brought them together where one does the after party, one does the registration and expo, another one does the technical race. That way, at least everyone is earning something and you've got more focus and we're learning from each other. Every race held increases the confidence. I think we really need to get out there and start holding events. Um, in your countries, can we just do a quick Roundup, where are you? Are you are you able to hold events? What's the plan in the various countries? Bhutan, I know that you should be holding an event soon. Um, I know there is a desire, but are you actually holding local events? Someone from Bhutan? Is there someone from Bhutan on? How about some of the other places? India. What's happening in India, someone?
Corinne from Singapore. Are you holding events? Uh, at the moment, we can build events at the stadium. Sorry, you are? Hello? Corinne? Yeah, Karen, can you please repeat? Uh, we are holding track and field events. Okay, okay. And is there any plan to hold road events? And if not, what is what do you see is stopping you? Can I come in? Yes. Uh, in uh, India and uh, in the province of Maharashtra, we are planning to have one small marathon this 29th. And uh, the main main uh, problem to hold any marathon or any events is the government restrictions. And do the government restrictions identify participation events as a separate category? Or do they lump them all together with concerts and, you know, concerts and weddings and funerals and so on? No, for everything, there is a restriction. Even, even for funeral, it is only 50 persons. Even for a wedding, it is 100 persons. So restriction yeah. for everything. So maybe this Sunday we'll come to know how many people will be wedding, even if in the case of uh, only if the government permits. If they have said now, we can go ahead, but I don't know whether uh, it will really will be held or not. Okay. Uh, and again, uh, sir, I'm Haridas from India. Yeah. Uh, also uh, from another province uh, known as Kerala, the southern part of India, <laughs> where the uh, COVID condition is the worst. Uh, TPR is around 20 percentage even now and in India around 60 percent of daily positive population is from my stage so practically <laughs> uh, within near future there is no hope for any sporting even even having our state championship to uh, represent the state in the national level competitions which the federation is having we are conducting it national championship that is a present scenario in Kerala so I, we hope in the near future it may get better. Thank you. Okay. Any other country willing to add something? Yes, Mr. Rajas, please. Where is Mr. Rajas? Hands up. Mr. Rajas? You have a different hand? The records? Hello. Yeah, hi. Can you hi. give some? Yeah. I, I, I'm Rakes from Nepal. In here is not uh, from last year. Uh, in here, not opening any any anything to, to organizing. So before we did uh, lots of event as a as a, I, I, I as a rest director I did. I, a lot of events in here, but uh, nowadays, it, for, by the COVID, the government didn't give the, any permission to do any uh, activities. So we have a we have a lots of planning to do. Uh, maybe uh, after month we have a plan to do uh, on spring championship and the cross country and road races too, but uh, they are not giving. To ask for permission. Is there any country uh, on on this um, symposium that that has recognized participation events, running, cycling, triathlon, uh, walking, as a separate as separate from gathering? Has any, any country done that? Because I think that is one of our biggest problems that we are lumped, you know, in with concerts. Rakesh, you've raised yeah, your hand. Any, uh, no, that, that was auto, auto, auto on that. 
Oh, sorry. Has any country, I think this is a big problem that we are lumped together and yet we are totally different events. And I think this is a role federations can play is getting together with some of the other participation federations and making an approach to uh, Department of Health, Ministry of Health. Uh, I mean, the ones that we are involved with are health, sport, industry, and tourism. And the point is that we, if you, if we are different from concerts, we're different from weddings, we're different from parties. We are not getting together to be together, we're getting together to uh, at the start. And once that gun goes, we are 100% safe. Our risk is in the start. Our risk is in number collection. When we're on the road running, trust me, we if we look at the numbers and we look at the width of the road and we look at the speed of the runners, we are well over, well over any social distancing. And it's actually quite easy to calculate. You know, it's not rocket science to calculate and you can prove these facts. So we should be a separate grouping in terms of what are the maximum numbers that we can have, in my opinion. And I don't think we're doing enough as federations. It, it can come in some way from world athletics, but it needs to be um, it needs to be approached on a national level because situations and ministries are different. If we run some figures, and I'm sorry, I, you know, as I said to you, I study this COVID thing, so I'm going to put forward a viewpoint, and it is it can only be a viewpoint. See, uh, the disease center in America noted that 78% of the deaths that they had came from people who are overweight or obese. Um, there was research done in UK modeling park runs, 10,000 park runs, 2.63 million participants. Um, in 10,000 events. Right? And they found that modeling, the way the scientists have been modeling for all these waves, they would expect 404 infections out of 2.63 million participants. Four of them would come from uh, crew members and 300 and or 400 would come from uh, the participants. Now, I mean, out of 2.63 million, that's negligible. Many of you will be aware of uh, Mass Participation World, which along with World Athletics have been running a sort of counter type study where anyone that's held an event can uh, feedback and any reported infections two weeks after the event was held. So I've filled in a few of those already, um, but they're now standing since October last year at just under 3 million participants in 30 plus countries. I think it's 32 countries. Um, and they've had four reported infections. Our events are not a risk event, right? providing we do them properly with COVID compliance. They are not necessarily risk events. And I think we need to also see the other side of that. They are actually healthy events. You know, um, they are helping people both physically healthy-wise and psychologically health-wise. So 
we need to be part of that action. And I'm saying to you, every race that we can hold, whether it's with 100 people or 2,000 people or 20,000 people, increases the confidence for future races. Please give this some consideration, even if it's only running time trials. Satio, is it Satio? Hi. Am I pronouncing yes. that correctly? Yes, correct. Yes, it's Thank me. You. Yeah, yeah. I would like to share experience what happened in Indonesia. Like uh, last year after the pandemic, basically there is no race back in 2020. Yeah, what happened? There was a booming of virtual uh, race, which conducted by uh, many, many events, which normally they uh, conduct the road race. However, in Indonesia, Dur Marathon. How, Sorry, can you can you go back to the however? I think yeah. I think we lost you at however. Ulang lagi pak tadi ada terputus. Okay, sure. Sorry. Um. Okay. Uh, is it? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. I can. Okay. Can everyone... Yeah. Ha however, um, the Borobudur Marathon um, was held only for limited or invitation participant, and the total number of participant was only uh, less than thirty runner. Them are elite runner being. Um, selected by the Indonesian Athletic Federation, and when the when the organizer held the event, uh, they are doing it. Um, the organizer did in the um, Tokyo Olympic, whereby they uh, prepare like a um, bubble. Uh, they uh, hold a, a book a hotel, uh, and all the participant, the volunteer organizer they're all being tested uh, for uh, COVID uh, before they arrive and uh, return to their home base so that's what happened and the plan is the um, that event will be held again um, late, later on this year um, which um, the plan is to invite more participants but I think the number is still uh, far below uh, the total number when the condition is normal. I think that's what I can share at the moment. Thank you, Satya. Yeah, um, you know, I don't know. There, there's normally in every city uh, a place that runners go just to train, you know, a promenade or a park or something like that, yes? Yes. Has anyone has anyone counted the number of runners? Just stop somewhere along there and count the number of runners and walkers that pass you in one minute on these places. And you'll often find it something like 40 or 50 runners right, per minute. Okay. Now, if you look at what that actually means, and no one's con no one's really concerned about that. We're all going out and doing it again every day. Right? Um, if you convert that backwards into how many does that mean that you can have? So to give you an idea, in a 10K race with uh, 500 runners, you would get 60 runners per minute at 5Ks. So we are not, our problems are all in how we give numbers to runners, how we enter them, and how we start them. And I think that's just something to think about in terms of maybe having club time trials, trying to get people to understand the benefits of actually having road races or participation outside. And unfortunately, it's not been recognized as separate categories. And if I, if I look at cycling and triathlon and canoeing and stuff, 
you know, when you're on a bike, there's only a certain distance that you can get close to someone without falling or having a crash or whatever. And that's normally well over the, uh, over the, the social distancing side. So we've tended to be curtailed in our in what we're able to do because the regulations have not been negotiated um, in our favor. And I think the federations can use that or assist with that by assisting events to start opening up within acceptable limits agreed and negotiated with authorities. For tourism, any event is helping them and tourism is an industry that's lost big time in COVID. Uh, for industry, water, tables, marquees, etc., employment, you know, so these industries should be interested and of course sport and health uh, should be interested because people that are fitter, people that are psychologically and physically fitter uh, have greater resistance to COVID or any vi virus. So I think it's an opportunity that we should be uh, looking at. And we're an open air, we're a non-contact sport. So yeah, I could quote many other uh, figures to you um, particularly in Africa. South Africa is the worst in Africa. We've had 70,000 deaths out of a 60 million population. Um, yet in other places, the deaths are um, considerably less. The, the question is why? And if you check in the world, we're 87th out of 150th in terms of activity. Uh, we are very high in obesity, diabetes, blood pressure, anxiety. So, you know, these are things that we're not, we're, we're, I don't think we're leveraging well enough. Okay, let's look at what we think will happen. The screening forms need to be done prior to any entrance exit to a perimeter, uh, not the exit, but uh, entrance. Uh, we are being asked to do temperature check. We're asked that the data links. Remember, as opposed to even um, concerts or funerals, we tend to know more about our participants than any other sort of event out there. We know their age, we know their gender, we know where they live, we know everything about a participant if we've done an online entry. Uh, you talk about people going to the wedding, their family, their friends, but how many people actually know as much about them as we do about a runner coming into our event? It's easy for us to uh, do a track and trace, providing they are willing to feed back to us information. Okay, we've talked about this, the mass gatherings versus uh, distance events. We have minimized the gatherings because the gatherings are at registration, start and finish. And in fact, if there is nothing at the finish, and I'm going to uh, challenge that, if there's nothing at the finish, the finish of a 5,000, 10 kilometer race is 300 people per minute which over an eight meter wide finish um, is very easily handled if all they've got to do is to pick up a bag and go at the end of it. All the events that I'm involved in insist on a 20 to 25 meter no-go zone immediately after the finish line. And at the end of that zone, uh, everyone is given a new mask so that zone is where people cough and splutter and so on, which is why we minimize anyone in there. Um, yes, there is an official at the side to uh, 
be the line judge. Yes, there are three timekeepers behind them, but the idea is that that zone um, is an area where, which is considered a medical risk as well as just good social distancing and ideal for photographers. Um, access, uh, assess runners culture and discipline, that's very important for the COVID as we've, as we've said, but we're assessing that and we're making specific to that culture uh, and discipline level. Restrict participant numbers, that obviously has an impact on the financial viability of an event. And I think 500 is probably where the viability starts coming in for most commercialized events. Um, but, you know, you can have club events with 100 that break even. Uh, obviously, for commercial events, as I say, um, the numbers are need to be much higher or you need to be able to run staggered block starts. Um, every event pro provides a learning opportunity. And there are, here's the risk factors as I see them. The highest risk factor is at the registration um, or number collection. And there are ways around that. I mean, we can deliver numbers. We can use the Mr. Delivery or the Mr. Pizza Delivery or whatever you've got to link in with them to deliver your race packages. And they can also benefit from it as a sponsor, as a partner by having vouchers or uh, discounted pizzas for those that accept their numbers by delivery. You could do a drive-through situation um, for registration instead of the expo situation. We need arrival and admission uh, screening. Talked about that, and that's why I favor the, the, the Commonwealth Games, the Olympic type perimeter screening. Once you're in the perimeter, you've been screened, have a little sticker that goes on the race number or a wristband so people can see that you have been screened and you were checked on the way at temperature checking, screening forms, use of the phone with a QR code uh, that you have done your own assessment. Um, I do see places now starting to do quick tests. I, I think that is just I don't think it's really going to be beneficial. Certainly it's not going to be beneficial at the registration uh, in my mind, because you go there, you do your screen, you do your quick test, you create a 15 minute waiting area, which must be high risk anyway. So why do it? Uh, why add to your risks? Um, and that test is only as good as the minute it was taken. You then go home with your race number and you've probably interacted with more people on the way home and back again that limits the effectiveness of the test. So I'm not sure testing is going to be the answer. And I don't think testing, certainly for us in countries that start at five o'clock in the morning or six o'clock in the morning, I don't think it's practical on the morning of the race. Um, holding blocks can easily be big enough. The question is, how much spacing do you require between participants? I see a figure of three meters squared per runner um, gradually increasing around the world. If you really wanted a 1.5 meter radius, then that would work out, the area of a circle would work out about seven meters squared per runner. Is that practical? Not really. Um, prior to COVID, a platinum level uh, world athletics race required 0.24 meters squared per runner. 
I think the three is something that we should be building on. So in other words, if you have 100 runners, then you need a 300 meter squared um, area to hold that block of runners. And I think that's probably doable um, if you look at your venues and do you look at changing your venues to places that can offer you mass area. Uh, I've talked about the first 20 meters after the line, that is the next highest um, risk area. Ablutions are obviously a risk area, but the 1.5 meter Q line uh, can help you with that. It does mean having more port lose or ab ablutions at a race. The start procedure, if we come back again now to uh, the contender issue, the contenders are the only ones we need to start with the same gun on a gun start. So if we mark out on the ground 1.5 meter points, um, generally speaking, you can get five or six across and you can take that back. If those contenders are genuine contenders, you're probably talking of 100 people, which will take you back about um, 20, 30 meters. If you then give the command, and you've, uh, you remember most of these contender events have athletes' technical meetings, and you've explained to them how it will work. When you do take your marks, you allow them to move forward and crush up, and at the same time, you start the event. You've got a gun start with your contenders. Does that make sense? We, we've used this with 115 people successfully in the SA21 kilometer championships. So we line them up, we get them into the starting area, we have marks on the ground, well spaced, they're on there. At three minutes to the start, we put assistance in there with baskets, we walk them from the front to the back, taking masks, those masks are considered medical waste. They've then been told that from the moment that uh, we, we give the instruction on your marks, they can close up. And what was interesting is we didn't say to them, don't touch each other, but they closed up and didn't touch each other. And we fired the gun virtually immediately and we got a good start. No one complained about being at the back and disadvantaged. Uh, we had seeded that start, by the way, based on their uh, qualifying time or submitted time. So the fastest runners, fastest qualifying time runners were on the front. Because there hadn't been other races, some of the real fast runners were actually about five lines back, which was quite interesting. So that was um, the way we started that, and that, that worked quite well. Um, the, the remaining runners, the mass runners, can start on a rolling start, which doesn't require that. And as they go across the mat, you're giving them net time. You're giving them a mat time to a mat time at the finish. Uh, then refreshment points are the next critical. And then there can be a place where the route narrows down. And if that is the case, then um, you want to redo your calculations. But I promise you, you, you have to narrow that down to a very narrow amount to uh, get into a critical social distancing situation. And the finish, simply collect and exit. Um, we are really over, over time. So what I would like to uh, suggest is we stop here 
and just have a question and answer and comment. And I think we've got the basis and the foundation for moving forward uh, tomorrow. And we can be at a faster pace if everyone is happy that we start picking it up. Ria Stuti, you're, you're my conductor, please. Yes, okay. thank you, Nori. So, okay, it's time of uh, offer now. So if you have a question, you can uh, write it on the, on the, on the uh, WhatsApp group and I will invite and add Nori on the WhatsApp group as well. Or you can keep it for tomorrow. You can answer it, uh, you, can, uh, you can ask it, uh, ask your question for tomorrow. So tomorrow we will start at the same time, three o'clock, yes, three o'clock in Jakarta, Bangkok time. And uh, with the same uh, Zoom ID and passcode. Okay, thank you. Okay. Is there yeah, anyone? Thank you, Nori. Can we thank get you. some comments back just before you go, please? Because I yes, now yes, have sorry. the opportunity. I now have the opportunity of manipulating the next next things. I need some feedback, guys. Please. Oh sure, sure, sure. Okay, please, please feedback, guys. Comments. Uh, there is there is one one comment from Mr. Hadi that the Present pace is fine. Clarify is fine. Okay. Yeah. Guys, yeah, can, we, can we try more interaction tomorrow? Can you contribute more? Even if it's in the comments and uh, Rio Studi can, can just say uh, they've said this, this is good or they having problems, we can or can we put in maybe more uh, short two minute, five minute comments, you know, so that we are sharing more. I'm, I'm feeling that I'm putting in. <laughs> Another you know, comment. I, I would enjoy to get something back. Another comment, speed and content is fine. Okay. Okay, and I think the second. Uh, the, the pace is good. The pace is good. And then the presentation is good. And are we covering what you want to cover? We're now going to go into detail on things. So, you know, various aspects. But let's make sure that we're covering the correct thing. And another feedback, it is very informative session. Excellent. Good. That's what I would like to hear. But I also want to hear the negatives, guys. So put the negatives on a private <laughs> so far you get the positive <laughs> so far you still got the positive uh, feedback yeah. fantastic I look forward to seeing you have a great night over there and I will have my lunch now and enjoy the rest of my day you guys have a great time thank you very much for attending thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much see you Thank you very much. Okay, thank, you. You thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. See you. The gentleman from India um, who I said, can you stay on? Have you stayed on? I, I can't remember. Uh, so Satish. 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 Was it from the gentleman told you about the aims? Uh, Mr. Uh, Satish. The, the, the aims. You mean the aims uh, course, Mr. Uh, no, 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 no. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Satish, you are talking about the, uh, yeah, yeah. what in India the aims uh, organizing events. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Who is who is that uh, gentleman, please? Mr. Satish. 
He's not. He's not around. He's not. Can you WhatsApp him and give him my number? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you can do that, I will try and sort out the question with him. Yeah, okay, okay. I will send. And then, then can you and I just stay on at the end here a minute? Or can I pick up on a, a WhatsApp video with you? Yeah, yeah. Can I pick up a WhatsApp video with you, direct? I will, I will. I will invite you on the WhatsApp group in a second. I'm calling you, I'm going to call you now. Okay, so I'll leave this and I'll speak to you on WhatsApp. Thank you.